Dallas is born um, November 8th, 1986, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Full of energy from the word go, very rambunctious, um, very strong-willed. Anything on wheels that he could roll, that he could hurt himself on, he always did, every time, but he never stopped. He's just to see how he could perfect it. Well, he didn't like the telephones at first. He did not like them. But the day he learned how to text, my gosh, it just, it, it's like an addiction. Hudals did, just nonstop. That Sunday, July 18th, you know, he'd been doing, he'd done it, he'd been everything I could ask that kid to do for the last 24 hours, he'd done with a smile on his face. And so I let him borrow the car to go to the lake. <laughs> and about 10 o'clock that night, I called and said, you about coming home? You know, I gotta get up five o'clock in the morning. I'm on my way, Mom, right now. I'm leaving the lake, I'm leaving. All right, staff the phone. I will, Mom, love you. See you in a little bit. I don't think he stopped. I think as fast as he could text and fast as he could read. I know, and just reading that last text and just boom. He was reading the text messages and the way he drives, you know, he does that cool thing with this hand up on the steering wheel and leaning in this direction, you know, and leaning on the console. And he's reading and probably like this, reading. And he veered over, read, because it's also dark in the car. And so he's having to look down to see what it says on the phone. And he goes off, he heads off on the right and jerks the wheel back over to the left and overcorrected that time as well. And when he, and he yanked it back up onto the road. And when he did, it just kind of catapulted him off the road. And there's a big corner post, big metal one. It, it's a good, you know, foot around at least. Metal, hard metal. And it all it did was break the cement, but it literally went up it and kind it kind of pulled him airborne. And when he went airborne, the car twisted. And because I think he actually initially hit that's when he, he had turned so hard that he initially hit that side and it airborne him, but it also turned him and just slammed into a utility pole sitting right there. Not a small one either, like one of them. He had to get a nice big chunk one there. And uh, snapped it in half. When the highway patrolman got there that night, to uh, tell me about the accident. He'd actually, there all the skid marks on the road, he thought maybe there had been an altercation between him and another vehicle. And so I went in and got the phone records because I told him I had talked to him at 10 o'clock, or right, somewhere around 10 o'clock. And so I went in and pulled up the phone records. Being a mom, I do that kind of thing. And as soon as I pulled it up and seen the page, uh, well, and I just hit print because I knew right away. I could tell as I went straight over to the text messages. And there was no doubt, there was no doubt in my mind that night, I knew what had happened. You know, he had to finish investigating the accident, but I was pretty sure that he was just texting and not paying attention. And it was a head injury, because he hit his head on this piece right here. And you can't, you know, you just can't fix your head. And you know, that's something that parents really don't want to have to look at. And nobody wants to have to see what a head injury is because it's like a pumpkin. Literally, because it just goes that way. And there's nothing they can do. Now, Dallas is 23 years old. 23 years, I think we counted up uh, seven months and eight months and seven days. You know, this is basically what we have left until I figure out what else to put them in. But it's kind of a, a waste of life, a waste of opportunity, and, you know, just a, a, a waste of the what, you know, what if, what if, what if. You know, we just need to put our phones away, put the phones away. It can wait, it really can.
just remember sitting at home thinking to myself, it's like, I have no one. I, like, my friends were there for me at first, but after a while, they weren't. I looked up on her Facebook page, and she said on there, can anybody please hang out with me today? I don't have any friends. Before the car accident, the things I did in high school with my friends were, you know, just go to the high school games and everything. Everybody can go to a party, go bowling. I was a good student. I was a role model. I was like a preppy little girl in high school, so I used to model. My main worry for Liz as a parent before she started driving was the typical teenage things, you know, the drugs and the alcohol and, you know, being safe and hanging around the right kind of kids and keeping her grades up. I did not think that Liz was connected to her mobile phone. I didn't realize um, that she loved her phone as much as she did. I used my cell phone every second, every minute, every hour. Like, if I didn't have it, I would freak out because I couldn't connect with my friends, I couldn't connect with anyone, couldn't connect with like, social media or anything. Like, if I didn't have my cell phone, I felt lonely. <laughs> I would ask her all the time, Liz, do you text and drive? And she said, no, Mom, I swear I don't. Don't worry, I don't use my phone when I'm behind the wheel. I ignore those warnings about texting while driving because everyone else was doing it, so I thought it was okay. I thought I was invincible, but clearly, I was completely wrong. I was getting ready for work, and then 12 hours later, I'm in ICU staring at my daughter, who's bald, and tubes running in and out of her body, and it's just overwhelming devastation over a stupid text. The consequences of my life now after the car accident is the fact that I'm blind one eye now. I cannot smell. I cannot hear that very good because a bone broke in half and covered my eardrum. Um, I can't create tears because both my tear ducts got damaged and I can't put my body to sleep naturally. I take medicine and go to sleep. The hardest part about my life after the car accident was the fact that I was alone. Everyone was away at college. I wasn't. I couldn't drive, I couldn't go to college. My friends were there for me at first, but after a while, they weren't. They got tired of me. They got tired of all my problems. Don't text your loved ones when you know they're driving. It can change their lives forever. If you get a text, don't look at it. It's not worth it. to remember Trooper Nick Dees killed in the line of duty to honor his ultimate sacrifice for doing his job. From afar, you can see the flashing lights and traffic stop just ahead on the interstate as Trooper Birch pulls up. We got a crash. The trooper parks his patrol car not far from a semi on its side. You the driver? Yeah. You okay? After talking to people on the scene, Trooper Birch backs up and moves his patrol car to a different spot. You see traffic slowly driving by to the right of it. Almost two minutes later, everything changes. Troopers Birch and Dees walk into frame when all of a sudden Birch starts to jump out of the way. That's Trooper Dees with his back to the camera in his final moments of life.
The Seminole County Courthouse full of troopers as Stephen Clark is led in the back door. Cameras were not allowed in the courtroom. Clark faced the judge sporting a black eye and wearing a back brace. He asked the judge how to go about getting an attorney and how to get out of jail. He also answered a few basic questions like his name and date of birth. The harder questions came in the hallway. Mr. Clark, do you have anything to say for yourself? After asking permission to answer my questions, he does. I'm very sorry. I, if there was anything I could do, I don't even know what happened. If I could undo it, I would. He then entered an elevator, and we ran down to meet him to hear his answers more clearly. I'm very sorry. If, I don't even remember what happened, but if it was in any way my fault, which I'm sure that it was. I'm sorry. I, I would fix it. I would change anything. I, the fact that a man's life weighs on my soul, I, I don't know what to say. We have to put our feelings aside until the job is done. Today is a great opportunity for us to get together as a family and not only honor, but celebrate the life of Trooper Dees. Hundreds traveled to the town of Broken Bow to honor their friend, husband and father to two young girls. A son gone too soon doing a job that he loved. We're human. Underneath this uniform, bulletproof vest, gun and hat, we're people just like everybody else. We have just chosen a career to serve and protect. A career that ran in the family. Dee's father was a trooper. His friends say he was a joy to have on the force and a partner to anyone who needed him. The term partner for us is anybody that wears the brown shirt with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol patch on it. It's a brotherhood. Um, everybody that wears this uniform knows what to expect when you go through that academy. Uh, you've proven yourself and you're accepted in the fold and we take care of each other and, and, and families um, the way families take care of one another. Troopers say once you're in the force, you're family, and that goes for all of the family. The OHP division has vowed to assist the Dees family in whatever they need for as long as they need. Absolutely. Um, there will be people in place that will check on her and make sure that she's taken care of, um, you know, as long as she needs us to be there. The town of Broken Bow, although brokenhearted, came out in full support to express their deep feeling of pride for the man they knew and respected until the end. We lost a good man the other day. Bodyguard, dismissed!